Good morning, Walden Church. I'm sure that you've heard that Emma Roberts, who previously starred in American Horror Story, she is set to star in a brand new sitcom called Hot Mess. Yes, it's about a woman whose personal life implodes because she goes on a reality show, one of those TV dating shows, and she loses and she has to make the ultimate walk of shame and head back home. If you, you've heard this phrase, right? A hot mess, yes? Some, you say something or other is a hot mess or a person, they're, you're saying they're, they're a hot mess. Well, it's, it's slang, right, of course. And just like any other phrase, it, it has an origin. You'd probably never guess where the phrase hot mess comes from. You think you have an idea I might, might where it came from? It dates back to the 1800s. <laughs> I bet you didn't think that. And it's from the military. Yes, it started with food, right? Because of mess hall and mess kit. And so by the 20th century, the military began to use the phrase a hot mess to describe a very dangerous environment. Like, you know, we're heading into a hot mess. Well. By the 21st century, we had all changed our definition of hot. Hot started to become a attractive person, right? So hot mess then started to describe an attractive disaster, something that looks a lot better than it actually is. And this morning, I would like to suggest that that's you and me, that's us. We are a hot mess. In fact, I hope that's why we're all here at church this morning. True, we might clean up good, right? We look nice on the outside. You'd never know it by looking at us, but underneath all of our church clothes, we're a mess. Well, I don't know if I would describe myself as a mess. Really? Okay, well, we all have messes in different places. All of our messes vary in size and shape. Maybe it's finances, maybe it's family, could be your marriage, could be your in-laws, could be relational, could be at the job, right? Could be professional. Maybe you're at school, could be your grades, could be an academic mess or your GPA is a mess. You married into a mess, right? You were warned, your friend said, oh no, don't, don't marry that person. And you said, oh, I can fix them. Or, or it's your in-laws, right? Or maybe it's your health. Maybe your health is a mess. Maybe your roommates are a mess. Maybe your parents are a mess. Maybe your children are a mess. Somewhere, somehow, you can look in the mirror and shrug and say, eh, life's a mess. Yeah? You can either identify or you shake your head. You're like, nope, nope, not me, life is good. Okay, well, if life is good, then probably you're just one dumb decision away from your next mess, right? Because life is messy. Life is messy. You either create it or you inherit it. But that's just the way life is. It, is there good news? Yes, there's good news because that is why we are here. The good news is, right? What's the good news? The good news is there's someone else that's worse off <laughs> than you, right? There's somebody else out there, their life's messier than you. That's, nah, that, that's not the good news. That is not the good news. No, the real good news is it's not just you. It's not just you. The mess is what brings all of us here together today. It's true, right? It's true, but we forget that, don't we? Think about it. We're all, we're all secretly watching each other. We're all watching our neighbors critical of our families, watching our in-laws, we're watching our kids or watching our grandkids and secretly, never out loud, secretly, we're critical about the choices that they're making. We're critical about how that, that guy was driving too fast or that guy who cut me off. We're judgy about how other people run their lives and yet, it's the mess that brings us all here together today. Because as I'm sure we can all admit, your life, my life, it's a mess as well. 
I want to offer that there was once a great theologian, <laughs> a great writer, and uh, it was Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley had a song, not as popular as his others, but uh, it was one of his slower songs, and it was called Men with Broken Hearts. You should listen to it after this if you have a chance. Go and listen to Men with Broken Hearts by Elvis Presley. Listen to the words. But there was one passage, one verse where he says, if you could see through my eyes instead of your ego, I believe you'd be surprised to see that you've been blind. He's not wrong. In fact, it sounds very much like something Jesus taught once. You know, what Ellis is trying to say is, before you judge someone, you find out what their story is. You know, I think when you find out what someone's story is, and you find out why they are that way, why they make those decisions, then I think you see them a little differently. Instead of judging them, you're sympathetic towards them. Maybe you're even, you know, feel, feeling sorry for them. You know, I wonder if you've ever just kind of looked around and thought, oh wow, I haven't seen so-and-so in a really long time. You ever done that at church? Kind of looked around and thought, I don't know, I haven't seen so-and-so in a really long time. I wonder where they went. Perhaps people leave the church because at one time or another, they are going through their own mess and someone close to them overhears them finds out and is critical of their choices, judges them. I don't blame them for leaving because that is not what a church is supposed to be. It's the mess that brings all of us together. In fact, Jesus said we should be students, not critics, because we are all just one dumb decision away from being a hot mess ourselves. I said earlier that I thought Elvis' song sounded like a teaching of Jesus. It's Matthew 7. He says, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Just imagine where we would all be today as Christians. Just imagine where Christianity would be if we could just get even this single one teaching correct, right? Because how often are we saying instead, <laughs> would you get a load of this idiot? Look at this, look at this idiot over here. Look at these idiots in Washington, right? I have unintentionally been rude to someone before in my life. I have. I have unintentionally cut somebody else off on the road. I have. And I am sure that in those moments, somebody else judged me and called me an idiot. And I probably was. But notice Jesus is teaching. He doesn't say, you know what? All you guys are idiots. <laughs> he doesn't say that, which is actually the truth. No, in his teaching, he says, you are all brothers. You are all brothers, meaning you are all family. Yes, this person over here, they dug a hole for themselves and you're their family. You're their family. So help them get out. Don't point and laugh because next time it'll be you that dug yourself into a hole and it really works a lot better when we all work together. I said earlier that it's the mess, right? It's the mess that brings us all together. Where do we learn that? We learn that from John 3.16. Jesus says, God so loved the mess, right? God so loved the mess that he sent his son to help us each with our own mess. Not like it was in Noah's day. No, that was two weeks ago. Back then, God saw the mess and said, y'all are crazy. And he sent a flood, washed the slate clean, started over. No flood this time. This time, he sees the mess and he rolls up his sleeves. And you'd think, that someone who came to help would be welcomed. Jesus wasn't welcomed. He wasn't even recognized as the Messiah, was he? Why not? Well, 
because a God who helps? That's not what gods do. You know, in mythology, gods don't help. Gods judge. Gods punish. Gods condemn. The Hebrews thought God would come and reward them for being good and punish all the bad people. But, as Jesus points out, we are all family. There are no good people and bad people. And Christians, we still do this, right? We still do this. We are no better. We still look at the world through this lens of good people and bad people. That's why Jesus had to say, love your neighbor as yourself. That's why he had to say, love your enemies. The Bible even went so far as to say, slaves, obey your masters. Does that mean that God is pro-slavery? No, that's ridiculous. But it went back to Jesus' commandment to love our enemies. Jesus was a God who came with forgiveness and grace. He didn't come with lightning bolts. He didn't come with damnation. Jesus wasn't Rome's enemy, right? In fact, it was the Jews that brought him to have him killed, and Rome tried to set him free. His own people thought he was a threat because he preached a message of love, because he refused to hate Rome, and because he said, no, you, we're all sinners. All of us need God's grace. This is why the gospel is so important today. It's for that mom who thinks that she's a hot mess because she can't keep it all together. We need to find her and tell her, no, that's what we all have in common. I'm a hot mess too, but Jesus loves us both in spite of that. Church is not a place for people who have it all together. And that's not why we have the Bible. Yes, the Bible contains rules. The Bible has rules for sure, but the rules are not there to make us feel bad. So why are the rules there? Well, quite simply, the rules are there to show us God. It's true. After Jesus in the New Testament, we're given another person who becomes our teacher. His name is Paul. Paul is a Pharisee. Yes, the very same people who killed Jesus. What does that mean? It means Paul is not perfect. Paul is flawed. Paul is not a saint. 1 Timothy 1 says, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And Paul says of whom I am the foremost. Paul says, I'm a bigger sinner than anyone. Paul can say that, not because of modesty, but because he was a Pharisee. He knew the law so well that he knew all the places where he fell short, which means he knew all the ways in which Jesus needed to save him. In the church, we elevate Paul. In fact, we would rather follow his rules than follow Jesus. We call him the greatest Christian. But Paul started off as a rule follower and a finger pointer and a persecutor. And after he met Jesus, he spent the rest of his life trying to get away from that. In fact, Paul was so excited to tell other people about Jesus that he traveled all around the Mediterranean and he started churches. And after he got home, he wrote them all letters. And those letters ended up becoming the ending of our Bible. And because I think he understood his own sin so well, his writings on sin are so intelligent and they're so incredible. I mean, just listen to Romans 3. He says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Paul says we are all under the law, right? That's the first thing he says. We are all under the law. What does that mean? Well, it means if you are under it, then it is over you, correct? Of course it is. In some ways, all of us are living under a law, right? It could be the law of the land. It could be the law of your company. It could be the rules that are in your house. 
If you live in a, a community, right, like a gated community, you live under the, the agreement that all the other houses agree to. You follow all those rules. Some rules might even be just something that you feel. You have a personal consciousness, right? And you, 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 you know it in your heart. Paul is a rule follower. That's how he was raised. He would get in your face if you didn't drag your trash cans back to the garage. He would give you a ticket if you didn't put your shopping cart back in the corral. If your window tint was too dark on your car, if you backed into a parking space when you weren't supposed to. Paul is a person who believes life would be better if we just all followed the rules. But what happens when we break the rules? Let's say I didn't pick up after my dog. Let's say I throw my old branches into the abandoned lot next door. So I set off a few firecrackers. What are you going to do? Nobody's perfect. Don't you hate that response? Nobody's perfect? Like that's your excuse. Nobody's perfect. Well, it's true. Right? It's true. Nobody is perfect. And when you say that, when you say that, can you just admit then, if nobody is perfect, then at least you understand that perfect exists. You understand that perfect exists. The law is there to show us that nobody is perfect. But Jesus came to show us, yes, but perfect exists. Paul says perfection exists, and we don't measure up. And he says that we're all held accountable to the law that is over us. And he says, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God, who is your God, right? Who is the law? What is the law that you follow? We all fall short of something. We all fall short of perfect. And Paul says, yes, none of us are perfect, so shut up. That's what he says. He says it in nice Bible language, though. He says every mouth may be stopped. Other translations say silenced. But that's what he means. We are all under the law. None of us are perfect. So we should all just shut up. Nobody is accountable to you. The whole world, Paul says, is accountable to God. Then Paul really drives it home and he says, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Why do people stop coming to church? This verse. The law brings us knowledge of sin. The law reminds us where we fall short. Why did you stop coming to church? Eh, it's too preachy. Pastor was always making me feel bad. pastor wasn't making you feel bad. That's the law. The law reminds us that we do not forgive quick enough. The law reminds us that I am very bad at loving my neighbor as myself. The law reminds us that I am not so good at forgiveness. The law reminds us that I am not quick to love my enemies. Paul says the law that you live under reminds you that you don't measure up. That's why we have the law. There is a habit that we can't stop. There is a darkness that follows us. The law that we are under is a measuring rod. It is not a finishing line. Okay? It, the law is a mirror that reminds us who we are. And who are you? Paul so famously tells us a few more verses down in verse 23. You are. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All means all, and it's that mess. It's that same mess that brings all of us here together today. The reason why you can recognize a mess when you see it is because we all deep down know how it should be. It's that awareness of the mess that awakens us to something that we all agree we are accountable to. God. The law isn't there to force you to try harder. The law isn't there to force you to be a better person. The law is there to make you aware that there is perfect. That's outside of you. 
and you are held accountable to it. For instance, uh, we like to play games in our house. And uh, we each play different games, really, though. Uh, Joanna and Peggy, they like backgammon. They like Yahtzee. Uh, I like big games with lots of parts and pieces and dice and cards and rules. The boys like video games. But occasionally, we'll all get together and agree on something to play. So we'll play Monopoly or we'll play a card game. And you know, it's the darndest thing when the youngest child wins. We all, expect a jo we all expect Joanna to win because she's the smartest one of all of us. But when the youngest one wins, we kind of pat him down afterwards or flip his mat over or we check his sleeves because the worst thing is when someone wins by cheating. I would prefer even to fail, Sophocles says, with honor than to win by cheating. Nobody likes a cheater because the rest of us all have decided that we are going to play by the rules. We didn't even write the rules. There is an outside authority, a higher authority, the Parker brothers, right? George, Charles, and Edward. They wrote the rules. It was those guys who said, when you land on a property, you must buy or auction it. It's true. Those are the rules. When you land on a property, you must buy or auction it. Those are the rules. And you don't get any money for landing on free parking. But we always play that way. Well, that's because a survey showed that 68% of Americans have never read the rules to Monopoly. 68% have never read the rules to Monopoly. And another 49% admit that they invent their own rules. This bothers the rule followers of the world. <laughs> but it's also a good reminder. None of us are perfect. None of us are perfect. C.S. Lewis was like Paul, another super smart Christian writer. Uh, he wrote a book called Mere Christ Christianity. Great book, super great book, hard to read book. But right off in chapter one, he talks about watching two people fight, right? Two people are arguing. And he says, you know, when you point fingers and when you accuse, we're all pulling from some invisible rule book and he says, when two people fight and they accuse each other of wrong or they accuse each other of unfairness, we are in essence saying, hey, you broke the rules. But what rules are we talking about? Before C.S. Lewis became a Christian, he said this drove him crazy. He said there's a standard of right and wrong that exists outside of us, which we're all governed by and which we appeal to each other in our interactions with each other. And to further illustrate the point, Lewis considers the excuses that we make. Why do we make an excuse when we behave badly? We don't make excuses when we behave correctly. So what law do we need to be excused from? He says the truth is we believe in decency so much, we feel the rule of law pressing on us so that we cannot bear to face the fact that we are breaking it. And consequently, we try to shift the responsibility. You cheated at Monopoly. That's not fair. I did this, so you should do this. Lewis points out that what you're really doing is you're appealing to some sort of standard of expected behavior. There is this assumption that the two people involved both have a shared idea of right and wrong. So Lewis points out, that when one of you makes an appeal to that standard, the other person who was wrong simply says, forget your standard. And he proceeds to make an excuse as to why the standard doesn't apply to him. We all do it. We all do it. We expect others to be fair with us, but when we feel like we can break that rule, or we don't feel like doing the right thing, then we make an excuse. We argue that there should be a reason that I get a pass this time. Can you imagine in the Astros game, if the batter said, hey, you threw the ball when I wasn't ready. Can you throw the ball again? No, those are the rules. Before C.S. Lewis was a Christian, he didn't understand what this thing is. What is this thing that we are all held accountable to? And then when we break it, we feel bad. Lewis points out that the standard, we used to call it the law of nature. 
And he says, no, 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 it's not the law of nature. It's the law of human nature, because only humans do this. The laws of nature are things like gravity. That can't be broken. It's the same for everyone. But the law of human nature says that, you know, if I do this, or if I do this, then my life will be better. But I don't do this. I break those rules all the time. We know we ought to live in a certain way. We know we ought to be sensitive towards one another. We all know that we should be fair with one another. We all know we should show compassion to one another. We all know we should forgive one another. We all know that we should live in peace with one another. But we don't. We all know there is a law, but we occasionally ignore it. There is something above and beyond and real that none of us made, but that is pressing on us. Something is over you, Paul says. We feel the pressure of our conscience, the pressure of we ought to. The pressure is the presence of God. And it's universal. It's every culture not pressing us to be better, not pressing us to try harder, pressing us to admit that he is the law. And once you can admit that you're not perfect, once you say that, once you say, eh, none of us are perfect, okay, if you can admit that, then the next step is admitting, yes, but perfect exists. And then you're just one step away from admitting that there is a God. We get it wrong. We get it wrong. About the rules, we get it wrong. Paul says, be silent with one another. No pointing fingers. No condemning each other. The rules already make us feel bad. The rules already make us feel shame. So we don't need the church to be the, the ticket giver. We don't need the church to be the, the rule police. The rules were never there to make you feel bad. They are there to reveal. They are a reminder that there is a standard. That for our mess, there is also the opposite. There is an unmess. There is a perfect, and it is not us. It is beyond us. So that's, that's, our, that's our head knowledge. Now we, need, now we need a takeaway, right? We need, we need some sort of homework, something that we can try out. I'm going to give you some homework. It's super easy. Super easy. You ready? All right. We said today that we all have something in common. We're all a mess, right? So we're going to try this exercise. Try it with the person that you don't get along with. Try it with that person that you rubs you the wrong way or that you don't speak to at work or that you just think is annoying or try it with the people that you don't like. You know, you say, I don't, I don't like people who, I don't like men who, I don't like women or politicians who do. Try this with those idiots in Washington the next time, okay? When you feel the urge to point out the latest mess of some politician or a coworker or your in-laws or your idiot brother, instead of being judgmental, instead of being critical, instead of pointing out somebody else's flaw, for one week only, instead of saying something out loud, you say this to yourself instead. I know a mess when I see one because I am one. I know a mess when I see one because I am one. It is the mess that brings us all together. It is the mess that brought Jesus near. It's why we gather around the table. That's why we have communion, because each one of us needs Christ. Each one of us needs the cross. Each one of us needs grace. Each one of us needs that perfection that lives outside of us, because we are not. So with each other, we are silent. Jesus says, before you ever take the speck from your brother's eye, you remove the log from your own eye first. Guess what? That's never going to happen. You're never going to be able to clean yourself up so well that you'll be able to approach another person to point out their flaws. 
So Paul says, just be quiet. And just realize that we're all in this together. Paul says, these are all your brothers. These are all your sisters. These are your family members. We are all children of God. None of us are perfect. And it's that mess that brings us all together. Let's pray. Lord, I should probably start off every one of my my prayers by saying, I'm a mess. I'm a mess. And it is the mess that brings me to my knees. It is the mess that drives me to prayer. It is the mess in my life. It is the mess in my children's lives. It is the mess in my friends' lives that I bring before you all the time. I, I bring you a mess. And I say, please help me. Please clean this. Please wash this. Please straighten this. Please mend this. Please fix this. I am like a child that brings you my broken toys. I am a child bringing you my dirty clothes, hoping that my parent, my Heavenly Father, can fix the mess. Lord, I pray for my own mess, and I pray for the mess of those around me. I ask me, I ask you to help me to stop being so critical of others, so judgmental of friends, so judgy of my children, so judgmental of people in leadership or people in Washington. None of us are perfect. None of us are perfect. Only you are perfect. This is why we confess. This is why we confess our sins to each other. This is why we confess our sins to you. To remind ourselves that we need you. The law reminds us that we need you. Your words also promise that you will wash us clean and that we'll be whiter than snow and that you, when you look at us, you only see your children that you are so proud of. You do not see the mess. May we learn to see ourselves this way too. Amen. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for being a part of this uh, worship celebration. Of course, we always uh, invite you to come by. We're here. We are here every Sunday at 9.30 and 11. We have a traditional service at 9.30. We have a contemporary service at 11. And at 11, we have a full children's program from birth all the way through high school. And we would love to be the church where you live. Thanks, guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.